Though the Adeptus Astartes are, for the most part, soldiers of the Imperium of Man, there have been innumerable examples of those who refuse to fight for the Emperor. The vast majority of these are the heretic Astartes, most notably the traitor legions who serve the ruinous powers, but there have been some down the years who, at least at first, were not corrupted by the forces of chaos. Some, most shockingly, have been denounced by the Imperium while still remaining loyal or have simply believed they could serve the Lord of Mankind better, free from Imperial control. In this, a collection of shorter tales and fact files, we will tell of some of these chapters and groups, as well as the circumstances behind their and others' betrayals. Though they are from creeds and worlds as broad and diverse as the galaxy itself, they are collectively known as Renegade Astartes. This is Tactica Imperialis, and welcome to 40k Stories. The list of reasons for someone within the Imperium to turn their back on it is, well, rather long. The Emperor's domain is tyrannical, uncaring and uncompromising in the vast majority of cases, and even its finest and best treated can become disillusioned with the whole thing. And all that comes before you consider the effects of Xenos infiltrators or chaotic corruption, which are capable of turning both individuals and whole populations from the Emperor's light. Of course, Space Marines live in a completely different bubble to the rest of the Imperium, and their mindset is also unique thanks to the conditioning they undergo during their transformation. This means that their reasons to fall slash go rogue and become renegades are different again from the rest of the Imperium, and truth be told, they are often more egocentric in motivation. Though it is of course not universal, as we will see later in this very log, many renegades come from isolated groups of Astartes, usually away from the chaplains who tend to the spiritual health of the chapters. They come to feel unappreciated, like their skills are being wasted on an uncaring Imperium, and to be fair, in the grand scheme of things, that's not an unfair assumption. Eventually, especially in these isolated cases, the Astartes will simply decide their skills are better used for those who will appreciate them, or simply for their own ends. They will strike out alone or as a group depending on circumstances, and in some rare cases even a large group or an entire chapter can go rogue, becoming known as renegades. Quite often, renegade Astartes will become mercenaries of some sort, probably selling their services to the highest bidder, and given the power of even a single space marine, I suggest said services are extortionately expensive. Others will become pirates and raiders, especially if they have numbers and or a fleet at their disposal, and I don't doubt they become something of a scourge if their Eldari and chaotic counterparts are anything to go by. Others still will seize or otherwise find their way to dominance of a world they find themselves on, perhaps even forging a small empire over a star system or so. How these worlds are ruled may well vary wildly depending on the individual Astartes who control them. I mean, just think about the difference between, say, a Salamander and a Karkorodon. Not that I believe any of them have gone renegade, but just an example. I'd be curious to see how the Imperium responds to the discovery of renegade Astartes, especially if it's only a small number who go rogue. I mean, obviously they'll want to send a reprisal against those they now see as traitors and or heretics, but what forces they send will be interesting. Do they send the chapter to whom the renegades once belonged? Do the Inquisition have a branch dedicated to dealing with it? I can't see them sending in the Astra Militarum unless it's absolutely necessary. It would potentially do more harm than good given the human perception of Astartes they might even be susceptible to conversion by the renegades in a worst case scenario. You know what humans are like. And if an entire chapter does go rogue, how the heck do they handle it, if they even do? The eventual fate for renegade Astarte's force varies wildly as well, even before we count any reprisals from the Imperium. Of course, there is death, either biting off more than the renegades could chew on a mission or in an invasion of their new little empires. Quite often, renegades will find their way to chaos, even if their initial turn from the Imperium has nothing to do with the ruinous powers. This is why the term renegade is very often applied to chaos space marines not part of the initial traitor legions, including the Red Corsairs we covered in a previous blog who, of course, were not initially chaotic as the Astral Claws. However, there are also those renegades, quote unquote, who are actually not traitors at all. Some, very rare cases, tell of renegades who abandoned the Imperium but still served the Emperor, acting in humanity's best interest, just free from the supposed shackles of the High Lords of Terror. They will still be hunted by the Imperium, since, you know, they ditched it to strike out alone, 
these not actually renegades will do the best for themselves and for the emperor. If you want an example of loyalist renegades, though the scenario doesn't quite fit with choice to abandon, we have looked at the soul drinkers in a previous log, as well as the Red Corps says. Unfortunately, information on renegades as a collective is rather scarce, so I wish to tell the tales of a couple of particularly renowned renegades instead. There is a slightly more comprehensive list than this. I suggest some research of your own. It's quite fascinating. The first is the Relictors, though that was not always their name. Originally, they were known as the Fire Claws, one of the 20 chapters known as Astartes Prices, whose duty it was to guard the fringes of the Eye of Terror and defend from chaotic incursion. Their gene seed, oddly enough, is believed to be a mix of Ultramarine and Dark Angel, and since their founding in M36, they liaised closely with Cadia and other chapters like them, including the Black Consuls and the Excoriators. Things started going wrong following the appearance of the Space Hulk Captor of Sin, near to the Forge World Stygias 8. Incidentally, this is the world purged by the Death Watch for housing the Xenorites, if you can remember that log. The Fire Claws, along with an Inquisitor de Mouche, boarded the vessel but found themselves caught in a fight with a Chaos Warband aboard and their leader, the Excoriator, no relation to the chapter we just mentioned, and his demon weapon. Suffice to say, this was a bit of a tough battle, and it was only one when the Fire Claws librarian grabbed the drop demon weapon by accident to decapitate the champion. After the librarian and Demarche returned back to the Fire Claws fleet, they were somehow able to convince the chapter master that the demon weapon and other artifacts like it were actually useful against Chaos, with the librarian citing a vision he had had when he held the demon weapon. To that end, the Fire Claws renamed themselves the Relictors, and along with Demarche, they went looking for more artifacts from the worlds around the Eye of Terror. This went on for several decades before the Imperium at large caught wind of what was going on, and when they did, let me tell you, they were not amused. A mix of Inquisition and Astartes came to reprimand the Relictors, arriving at their homeworld of Neutra in Segmentum Obscurus with a simple set of demands. Surrender the Chaos Artifacts along with the Mausch, and undertake a penitent crusade for their actions. All of this happened, with the Mausch being naturally executed, and the Relictors seemingly got on alright from there, fighting in places including Armageddon. However, they completely didn't learn their lesson at all, still seemingly hunting down Chaos artifacts to use against their enemies. After more visions from the librarians, the entire chapter would uproot from Neutra, even going into the Eye to collect the relics to use against the Ruiner's powers and bringing them into conflict with other forces in the region. This all culminated in a raid on a place called the Diomedes Archive on the world of Fremas, a place only known to the highest ranked of Terra's adepts, but revealed to the Relictors by a bound demon. Easily able to overwhelm the Imperial defenders, the Relictors made off with an incredibly powerful artifact and unsurprisingly drew the ire of the Inquisition once again. This time, however, there would be little to no mercy shown, as their star fort was attacked by the Grey Knights and about 80% of the chapter was wiped out. We don't know regarding this particular artifact. It was never returned to the Diomedes archive, but whether the Relictors escaped with it or the commanding Inquisitor was corrupted and took it for himself is actually unknown. At this point, the Relictors were unsurprisingly declared excommunicate traitoris, the same moniker as is applied to Chaos Space Marines, which probably was only reinforced by the flight of the survivors to the relative safety of the Eye of Terror. However, the Relictors are not known to have actually become Chaos Marines. They may well still be using the artifacts they've made off with to still fight against the forces of Chaos. As a result, I have chose to count them as renegades here rather than actual traitors. Maybe there's an optimist in me who wants to think they're still loyal, or at least uncorrupted even if they're not following the Imperium anymore. One might be excused for thinking the concept of renegades is a modern one, since all involved in the era of the Legionis Astartes were traitors or loyalists, right? Actually, surprisingly, wrong. A space marine contingent went renegade perhaps even before the Horus Heresy broke out, and had certainly gone by the time it ended. This force was an entire chapter hailing from the 19th Legion, the Raven Guard, known as the Ashen Claws. This 18th chapter of the 19th Legion was formed predominantly, if not entirely, of Terrans, and if you remember our log on the Sons of Korax, you will know this was a bit of a bad thing in the Raven Lord's eyes. Truthfully, 
Even before they became renegades, the Ashen Claws were feared by the Imperial Army, due to a pre-Korax incident known as the Battle of Hell's Anvil on the world of Baratrum. It was their Shade Captain, Narat Kirin, who devised a strategy to break the Hell's Anvil fortress that their army had been trying to take for five years at that point. Said stratagem baited out the drone armies of the human defenders from Hell's Anvil, whilst the Ashen Claws, two other chapters of the 19th, and a contingent of Lunar Wolves would sneak inside and take the relatively unguarded fortress. This was a huge success, and after the 19th used Melter Bombs to destroy the plasma reactor and thus the fortress, the rest of Baratrum was won in short order. But the massive losses suffered by the army as distraction caused the Ashen Claws to gain a reputation. Serving in the army alongside the Ashen Claws was pretty much a death sentence. Suffice it to say, this did not sit well with Korax upon his rediscovery, and neither did the fact that the Terran legionaries were descended from, for the most part if not entirely, the Techno-Barbarians, slavers, brutal warlords, and generally people that the Raven Lord did not get on with. This distrust or dislike toward the Terran contingent of the Raven Guard came to a head at the infamous Battle of Gate 42 or a large portion of said Terran contingent was sent by Korax and was wiped out in a frontal assault under Horus's command. By doing this, Korax accidentally wiped out the majority of the warrior lodges and or Horus loyalists within the 19th Legion, but he cemented his vision of the Raven Guard not long after by dispatching the Gate 42 survivors, along with others, on isolated crusades to the Ghoul Stars. These forces included, of course, the Ashen Claws, who didn't take kindly to their exile and abandonment for their efforts at Gate 42. They were left bitter, perhaps rightly so, and even when the Raven Guard was near annihilated at Isfahan 5, Korax never bothered to call them back to their homeworld of deliverance to aid in the rebuilding effort. As a consequence perhaps of this, or maybe even before it happened, the Ashen Claws abandoned the Raven Guard entirely and went renegade. They seemingly operated on the Loyalist side to some extent, fighting against the Night Lords in the Nostromo sector and causing trouble around the now-destroyed former home of the 8th Legion. However, they never held on to any of the targets they attacked. They pillaged them of resources and left, never fighting either for the Loyalists or the traitors. Their official status as renegades was only confirmed several years later, in the aftermath of the Thramas Crusade at the Battle of Desperation, yes, that's a place, in the Ketesh system. The Ultramarines and other Imperials were attacking the Night Lords based on Dark Angel intel, but partway through the Ashen Claws arrived to further attack the traitors. The Ultramarines chapter master present inquired as to their loyalties, and the now Praetor Kirin replied that it was to neither the Emperor nor to Horus, adding that he believed Korax to be dead. He wasn't, obviously, but I'm curious whether they decided that or they got that through hearsay and rumour. After all, it was pretty bad on Istvan. As it turned out, the Ashen Claws proved this point about their loyalty during the battle, attacking and harassing the Night Lords, but also raiding the main armory held by the Ultramarines. They made off with a huge amount of material as desperation was near destroyed by the Imperials, and then they fell off the grid for quite a while. However, the story of the Ashen Claws had a small additional chapter, as even 50 years after the Horus Heresy, the Renegades were still active and about. It was only fragments intercepted by Astropaths but it showed the Ashen Claws had established a base in the Ghoul Stars that they had been exiled to by Korax so long ago. Though we know nothing of it, their base was the world of Atar Gatis, but the only incident we know of in this second crusade was a world known as Orcades. Details sadly lost to time, as far as I know. Part of me wonders what became of the Ashen Claws, whether they eventually met destruction due to the attrition of their wars or some other, more glorious, maybe, fate? but I highly doubt the renegade sons of Korax are still around today. But if they are, then full credit to them, surviving that long whilst renegade, that's impressive. The final renegades I wish to tell the story of today only had said story brought to its conclusion very recently. The Knights of Blood. Not to be confused with the Chaos Warband of Korn, sharing the same name. As said name might suggest, the Knights of Blood are, or I should say were, a successor chapter of the Blood Angels. They weren't the worst sufferers of the Black Rage and the Red Thirst of all the Sons of Sanguinius, not being fatally undone by either of them like some poor sods were, but unlike the heavy sufferers like the Flesh Terrors, the Knights of Blood embraced the floor. They would become renegade officially in early M41, 
They launched a crusade, but assumedly the flaw and their suffering from it caused the knights to commit atrocity upon atrocity, including but not limited to eating humans to keep the red thirst at bay. So much so that the High Lords of Terror exiled them. This didn't mean that everyone went along with it, even amongst loyalists. Some chapters will only accept a space marine as renegade if said space marine declares as such, and these space marines still remain loyal despite their new status. Nonetheless, the Knights of Blood weren't going to take any allies, and even if they did, they were keeping them at arm's length. The reason for this was twofold. One, protect any allies from the Inquisition should they catch up with them, and two, make sure the floor didn't cause the Knights to attack said allies and murder them like they had so many others. Despite the risks, the Knights of Blood came to Baal as part of Commander Dante's call for the Sons of Sanguinius to unify in the face of High Fleet Leviathan. Though some, notably Gabriel Seth of the Flesh Terrors in a slightly ironic twist I suppose, distrusted the Knights and wished them gone. Dante somewhat reconciled them, at least enough to get them to fight in the battle that would become known as the Devastation of Baal. The Knights of Blood, along with the Flesh Terrors, because of sodding course they were, were sent to Brawl Primus, the first of the two moons, to hold it against the Tyranids. The two chapters did not fight together despite being sent there, mainly due to Seth's abhorrence of the Knights of Blood and their... habits. But as Brawl Primus finally began to be overwhelmed, both evacuated together. Or at least they would have done, had it not been for the appearance of the Cicatrix Maledictum across the galaxy and the Bloodthirster Kabanda on Baal Primus. His appearance caused a mass outbreak of the Red Thirst and all the Black Rage, which makes sense given it was Kabanda wounding Sanguinius on Sickness Prime that, in my opinion, triggered the rage for the first time. And at this point, the Knights of Blood, borderline unstable already, completely lost it. Their first blade, another title for the Chapter Master, and Astartes named Centaur Jewel, removed his helmet to speak to Seth one last time, as he had just, just enough control to do so. The efforts of the knights to halt the thirst had mutated and damned them all the faster, and they now bore similar appearances to those within the Tower of Armorio, where those lost to the Black Rage on Baal are kept, aka they look like Death Company. At this point, the entire chapter, what was left of it anyway, was gone to madness, and Jewel knew that if any say the Flesh Terrors saw them, the knights would be hunted down and destroyed. Actually, he wanted to fight with Seth, since he'd be the only one who'd understand at all what the knights were going through. Wishing to prevent both their hunting and corruption by corn and their thirst for blood, Jewel asked Seth simply to remember the knights of blood and not let the flesh terrors follow their example. He then led his chapter in one last penitent charge against the demons of corn as the black rage overwhelmed them all. The lost knights of blood were wiped out to the last on Bar Primus with Kabanda personally slaying Jewel after failing to turn him to corn, but their sacrifice allowed the remaining flesh terrors to evacuate. How history, both within the Blood Angels and the wider Imperium, will see them remains to be seen. Those not of Sanguinius' blood will probably see them as simple renegades, but to many sons of the Angel, they will likely become a cautionary tale, though maybe not actual traitors, since even at the last, even with the Red Thirst taking them over, they refused to fall to chaos and corn, who could have given them all the blood in the universe. So end the miscellaneous tales of the renegade space marines. Though their roads to exile vary as to their fates following said exile, one cannot deny that renegades are universally a force to be reckoned with. A space marine freed from the limitations of the Imperium who can strike out on his own is a dangerous thing to any he deems his foe and regardless of whether they go it alone, find their way to chaos, or maintain their loyalties to the Emperor, one must respect them for having the conviction to break free despite conditioning, or hold fast despite exile. Now, we have two more stops to make on our regimental road, and since I know where I want said road to finish, I have one planet to visit in the interim. This world breeds regiments that, at least amongst the regiments of renown that we're covering, are utterly unique, and truthfully quite fascinating. So I hope you enjoy our stop there, and I really hope you don't have a problem with heights. For now though, thank you for watching Tactica Imperialis, and I'll see you all again. Goodbye.